Baruchim Aboyim, thank you very much for coming. Um, this week's topic is about uh, planning for retirement. And the reason why I chose uh, this uh, topic is, again, we were dealing with 400s in our Gematria series. And I chose it because of the, there's a belief, and again, what we have today is a 401k, as an example for planning for retirement is that these, not the number 401 and the concept connects to our religious belief and our quest to acquire a higher place in the world to come. What does that mean? The number 400 is the gematria of the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet, the tough. The number 1, uh, aleph, is the, the gematria of 1, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the aleph. And the letter K is used many times as a symbol of something being kosher. So 401 alludes to everything from A to Z, from Aleph to Tuf. And the letter K is a connection to that which is religious, spiritual, and kosher. In the secular world, less than half of the population participate in an employer-based 401k retirement account. Religiously, the number of people who invest in their spiritual 401k retirement account is probably far less. We really should begin this lecture with the question of why did God put us on this earth? What's our purpose? Especially if one believes that God Almighty is a loving Father who is willing to gift us, his children, a place in the world to come. If that's the case, then why should we be concerned about our retirement account at all? The answer would seem to be that yes, God has set aside a place for us in the world to come, but he has given us an opportunity the privilege to earn our place rather than being given to us, much like a poor person, as charity. As the Talmud states, that a person would prefer one bushel of his own wheat to ten bushels of someone else's. And this is why today people even plant tomatoes in their backyard. <laughs> you know, you never walk into a supermarket where they don't find tomatoes. Yet people go through the expense and the bother to plant their own. They enjoy the feeling of benefiting from their own hands. To you, they give you a tomato that tastes and they tell you how great it is. <laughs> to you, it tastes like a tomato. But to them, it tastes like gold. It is only logical that he who puts more effort into funding his spiritual 401k will be rewarded with a higher place in the world to come. The key word, though, is effort. Because success is not ours. <clears throat> success belongs to God. There are very capable people who somehow never become successful. And there are others who are far less capable who become very successful. It is God and he alone who determines who and what will be successful. Not intellect, not timing, not good luck. As it states in Pirkei Avot, 4.16, Rabbi Kiva said, the world is like a hallway before the world to come. Prepare yourself in the hallway so that you may be enter the banquet hall. So what we do in this world will have a direct influence on what our lives will be like in the world to come for eternity. This also connects to the concept of the relationship between the weekdays and the Shabbat. We are told the one does not prepare throughout the mundane week for Shabbat then he will have nothing to eat on the holy day of the week. Our rabbis tell us that there is really no reward for a mitzvah, a good deed in this world. It is all saved for us in our 401k in the next world. So when we do a good deed, what do we receive in this world, really, is the reward for the thought of doing the good deed, not the action itself. The reward for doing a mitzvah in this world is the ability to continue to do other mitzvot. God does this by giving us money so that we can buy material things that we can do to do more mitzvahs with, such as a house, to do the mitzvahs such as hosting guests, putting up mezuzot, or a fence around the roof, or to buy a car, to be able to drive to shul or a study session, take our kids to Hebrew school, drive a friend somewhere. He rewards us with a good job so as to have money to buy the necessities of life and then make blessings over things such as food and clothing. 
to purchase tefillin, Hebrew books, to afford to send our children to a good Hebrew school, and even to study in the state of Israel. The list goes on and on. So God may keep the reward for our good deeds in our 401k account in heaven, but he continues to shower us with blessings, even for those thoughts that we cannot fulfill, though we wanted to. As a benevolent father, God Almighty considers a good thought as an action. However, with a negative thought, we are only culpable if we actually do the action, even though we meant to and could not. So if we have a 401k that we fund in heaven, which mitzvot should we invest in? And this becomes an interesting question, since the Torah only tells us a reward for two mitzvot. They are honoring our parents and sending away the mother bird. The mitzvah of honoring our parents is pretty straightforward. We are commanded to honor and respect both our parents. We are commanded, but we are not commanded to love them. We are only commanded to love God Almighty. And this can be, very, be a very difficult mitzvah in that when we are young, we may act foolishly and disrespectfully towards our parents. And when they are seniors, many times they may be sick and suffering from dementia. Still, we are commanded to treat them properly, regardless of what their physical or mental state is. So this mitzvah can present real challenges. In fact, we learn this out from the broken tablets, the luchos that Moshe broke. They were given the same respect as those that were whole. And for us to know that once a person has attained greatness, a scholar, we do not diminish his respect because he's gotten older or received some sort of sickness or dementia. Now the mitzvah of sending away the mother bird, on the other hand, is pretty basic. If you are in the forest and you happen upon a nest with eggs or little birds, you must send the mother bird away before you take her young. You cannot, you cannot take her, the mother with her young. You must send the mother away even countless times. This mitzvah but can only take place if you did not know about the nest before you send the mother away. It must be spontaneous. It cannot be premeditated. Now, what is most interesting about these two mitzvot is that these are the only two commandments that the Torah tells us what the reward will be. Arichat yomim. Long life. But in reality, these two mitzvot are on two ends of the spectrum. Honoring our parents is both difficult but logical. Sending the mother bird away may be a kindness, but it takes little effort or preparation. It would not seem to generate in any way, shape, or form the same reward as honoring our parents, and yet it does. The lesson the Torah is trying to teach us is that we cannot major in a mitzvah and forget about many others. We really do not know how God decides what is a big mitzvah and what is a small one. We really don't know what the reward for any mitzvah, what any good deed is. Not only that, but our sages tell us that one can do a small mitzvah with great effort and enthusiasm and receive a substantial reward. And on the other hand, one can do a large and important mitzvah out of rote with little or no enthusiasm and the reward can be minimal. Prayer, tefillah, is called avodat halev the service of the heart. There's a story told of a man who got lost in the woods and the sun was setting and he had not yet prayed the afternoon prayer, the mincha. He did not have a prayer book with him and he did not know the prayer by memory. He sat down by a tree, lifted his eyes up to heaven and he said to God, I am a foolish man. First, <laughs> I got lost in the woods. And in addition, now is time for me to pray the afternoon prayer and I don't know the prayer by memory and I don't have a prayer book with me so I would like to ask for a favor I'm going to sit by this tree and repeat the olive base the Hebrew alphabet over and over and over again and in your loving compassion can you please take all these random letters and turn them into words of prayer that I should have recited it was said in heaven that that afternoon prayer that this individual recited was the greatest prayer 
that was offered to God Almighty that day. Now sometimes a small act of kindness, something we just do, has great merit since we no, take no special pride in the act. We may even forget about it completely. However, God remembers, and though it may be only a small deed, it may be as precious to God as a small diamond, but perfect. On the other hand, one may do a small sin, steal a penny, and God may see it as a great sin and that the person never thinks about tshuva, about repentance. It becomes a perfect sin. There's, there's a, a story told in Pirkei Avot, chapter 6, Mishnah 9. It says Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma was walking down the road, and he saw a gentleman who greeted him, Shalom Aleichem. He greeted him back and said hello. And the, the gentleman saw, saw him, could tell by the way, looking at him, that he came from, the, from a place of rabbis, of learning. And he asked Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma, will you come back Bikumenu, in our place? And if you do, I will, we will give you jewels and diamonds, money. We'll pay you well. Come stay with us. And he answered the man and he said, I can only be a place with Torah and scholars, a place that's religious. When I first read this, I thought that he believed in elitism and not dealing with people, people that are below his level, regular people, and sharing religious values. That he was one of those that believed in religious cities. The ghetto was not made by the non-Jews. It was a Jewish creation to separate the religious from the irreligious, not to be influenced by them. And as we know by the Rebbe, that we believe in being Makarov people going out and bringing all Jews back to Judaism. So when I first read this, I thought that he was that type of person that was only interested in the religious elite, and he didn't deal with regular people. It was below his dignity. Then I looked closer, and the key word is bikumenu, bimikumenu, in our place. That's the key to the whole thing. What was this individual asking Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma. What he was saying to him is, you know, I know that we're supposed to eat kosher. But, you see, we're businessmen and we're on the road all the time. It's very difficult. What we want you to do is you eat kosher all the time and have us in mind. Bim kumenu, instead of us. We know that we're supposed to keep the Shabbat, but we really can't do that. Again, we have responsibilities and business and our wives want to go shopping, whatever it might be. So, how about you keep Shabbat Bikumenu instead of us, and we'll pay you. We know we should pray. We know we should put on tefillin. We know we should do all the mitzvot. But we really don't have time and an inclination. But we do have money. And we're willing to pay you with jewels and with a lot of money. And he declined. Because a person can't make someone else his messenger for a deed that he can do himself and should do himself. No one can put on tefillin for you. No one can eat matzah on Pesach for you. A person has to do these things by himself. There are certain exceptions, of course, but a person, even if a person can designate someone to do something for him, it's always better when he does it himself, and the reward is greater. May God bless us that we fund our 401k wisely with good deeds that benefit others in this world and our, our retirement account, our 401, in the world to come. Thank you very much, and make, make your wise investments. God bless and be well.